Thank you, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, month 16 of the shelter at home. Uh, probably feels like that to most of us. Um, uh, thank you, Carlene. Thank you, Ethan, also for helping to support this. Um, a reminder to uh, everybody as we uh, have uh, yet another amazing speaker with us today. Um, this series and the uh, Hirschberg Entrepreneurship Institute that's uh, now uh, uh, set up for May 7th and 8th, it'll be a 100% virtual uh, seminar, uh, has been sponsored by the New Hope Network, uh, by the Genuzzi Group, uh, by Bank of America, and by Whipstitch Capital. So we're really grateful to our sponsors for making all this possible. Um, in addition to the polling results that you saw earlier, it may be helpful for those who haven't been regulars to know that our audience is around 60% female. Uh, we are about half under 40 and about half between 40 and 60. Um, uh, I mentioned the Institute. Uh, it's been going for about 20 years. Uh, Andrew's been a, an important part of it, as have many of our speakers. Um, we have, uh, over the weekend, the panel of judges uh, selected all of the pitches with the 14 uh, companies who will be pitching for money uh, to our group of now over 40 investors uh, who will be with us that day on the Friday. And our, our, our uh, judges also picked the uh, four finance panelists and the four position your brand panelists uh, who will be presenting their cases to our incredible panels on the Thursday. In addition, we have speakers from Whole Foods, uh, NCG, Infra, uh, New Hope Network, uh, and um, and of course uh, we have workshops and uh, on cash flow and so forth. Our, our our mission with the institute and our mission with these webinars is always been to help you grow your business, basically to provide the kind of support and help that uh, I wish and a lot of my co-panelists here wish that we had had uh, back when we were starting. Uh, finally, so oh, so you can sign up for the Institute at hirschberginstitute.com. Uh, uh, Again, uh, cases have now been collected. Um, finally, and we'll mention this at the end, but to remind you, our webinar series continues uh, on Tuesday next week. I, I'm sorry, this Thursday, uh, I've lost track of what day it is. Uh, Drake Sadler, the uh, co-founder of Traditional Medicinals, will be on, and that's a real treat. Uh, Drake is a um, an amazing guy, an amazing friend, an amazing uh, mentor in and inspiration in this industry. And he has an interesting discussion that he wants to uh, have with us all uh, that day. Uh, and then next week we have uh, three webinars as well. Uh, I'll draw a special note to Wednesday. Uh, Pat Sheridan, uh, the CEO of Infra, Independent Natural Food Retailers, Ben Mand from uh, National Co-op Grocers, and Katie Paul from uh, uh, um, Kehi will be on to talk, as we talked last week with uh, UNFI, about uh, the perspective from the retailer, the independent retailers, and of course the wholesaler, Kehi. Uh, you'll wanna tune in for that, uh, it will be packed so you'll want to tune in early for that. That's on Wednesday, the 29th, 5 p.m. Eastern. Uh, now to get to our treat, uh, let me just say, uh, Andrew is uh, a remarkable entrepreneur. Uh, he has a, an extraordinary personal story that you will hear. Uh, on the personal side, I will tell you, um, I first met Andrew because my wife, who is a uh, breast cancer survivor runs a foundation, uh, the Anti-Cancer Lifestyle Foundation, which teaches a course on 360 degree behaviors that you can engage in to uh, reduce uh, the inflammatory conditions that, that create uh, cancer, that, that, that favor cancer cell growth. And of course, this is uh, exercise and nutrition and wellness and mental health, meditation. It, it, if you want to know more, you've seen the link up, it's the anticancerlifestyleprogram.org. Um, um, but the nutritionist for our program uh, came to Meg one day and said, you've got to try this stuff called Organ. I, I thought I knew a lot about the organic industry. This is, I don't know, God, a decade ago now. Uh, but I had never heard of this guy. And so it turns out very few had. 
except that he had created about a $15 million company with one unique feature, which is that he was the only employee. Now, let me say that again. He was doing 15 million in sales and he was the only employee. Um, and I'm sure Andrew will talk about that. Um, Meg tried it, said, you got to try it. I tried it, became hooked. You've been watching me during these webinars. I sip Orgain powders uh, and shakes, frankly, all day long. Um, I've lost 12 pounds in the last three weeks and I think it's Orgain or month. I think it's Orgain is the, is there, but Andrew, um, uh, and I got to be friendly. Uh, I joined his board, have been uh, honored to be part of his board ever since. And I've been astounded by his, uh, humility, his mission, his passion, his smarts, uh, also his hand on the pulse of the consumer. And so I think it's particularly important, Andrew, as we talk to a lot of folks today, we're nearly 200 of us on, who are struggling uh, to figure out. It was nice to see the polling results that less of us are struggling uh, than a few weeks ago, but we're all trying to figure out where is this going. And to have somebody who has uh, demonstrated again and again such an incredible uh, attunement to the market and I think whose products are really the right time uh, at the right time in the right place. So Andrew, thank you for joining us. The floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Gary. So thank you for the kind intro and, and thank you for having me. Uh, it's, it's an honor for me to be with everyone today, even though it's, it's virtually. And, and I know the theme is focused on uh, facing and overcoming challenges. So I'll be sharing some of the key lessons that I've learned along the way. And I'm going to watch the timer here uh, because if I focus on everything that has gone wrong, uh, we'd need this to be a much longer webinar. Uh, but I'm going to try my best to condense this as much as possible. So uh, with that, we could get started and we could go maybe to the first slide if we could pull that up. But this is a, uh, we could go to the next one even. Yep. So this is a, a big sign in my office. Uh, it's right over my desk and it says, the dream is free but the hustle is sold separately. Uh, and, I, and I've learned in my life, it's, it's really one thing to have the dream, to have the idea, that's all free, right? Uh, but the hustle is definitely sold separately and you have to be willing, to, as, a, as a starting point, you have to be willing to put in the work and actually execute. And I'm not just talking about the initial idea, I think what I've found it's every part of the business. You have to be able to really see it through. And I'll start, I think, by saying that for me personally, I truly believe and I found that obstacles are placed in our way um, really as a way, I think, to see if what we want is really worth fighting for. Uh, for me, the first obstacle was cancer. And as miserable of an experience as that was, if it wasn't for that diagnosis, there would be no organ. I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. And I wouldn't be who I am today. So what I'd like to do is maybe just start by giving you a brief background. I think it'll set the stage um, so that you know kind of how this came about. Hey, Andrew, let me yes. pause for a second. We're getting a little bit of static. And I'm okay. wondering if your headset, could we? You just have to get your mic off your collar. Okay. Uh, or, 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 or take the headset off. Let's see how that works. Just Well, how's this? Know. Is that better? Perfect. Yep. There it okay. is. I'll Thank just hold you. it there. Sorry about that. Thanks for letting me know. Okay. So maybe to start again with a brief background um, so that you know kind of how Orgain came about and how I've kind of come into so many different obstacles. So growing up, the plan for me since a very young age was to be a doctor. Um, I like to say that my parents allowed me to choose really any career path my heart desired or anything I wanted as long as I was going to be a doctor. That was, the, uh, that was the one caveat there. And I was actually completely fine with that. Uh, my dad is a pediatrician. I looked up to him, loved everything about him, was just an incredible human being. So I was perfectly fine with that. Uh, I enjoyed medicine. I went with him to work and liked everything about it. Now, uh, life took a bit of a detour. I was in my senior year of high school. I was playing varsity sports, applying to colleges. Uh, really kind of the, as you know, senior of high school is the best time of your life. Uh, you, you're you're worry-free, you feel invincible almost. And it was during my senior of high school, midway through, I just felt a small lump in my abdomen, didn't think much of it, 
told my dad about it. We got it checked out. A biopsy was taken. And it ended up being this really aggressive muscle cancer called rhabdomyosarcoma. And that completely changed everything. So I went from uh, being in high school and enjoying life to in a blink of an eye fighting for my life. So that was pretty dramatic for me. Of course, it was extremely difficult, not only on myself, but my family. And I had to undergo chemotherapy, radiation, surgery over the course of a year. So I would go to the hospital and I would get uh, these really aggressive chemotherapy treatments that would wipe me out, uh, wipe out my energy, uh, wipe out everything. I just felt horrible. And I would go home, try to recover, try to feel a little bit better and get on my feet. But on day 20, when I started to feel better, day 21, I was back in the hospital getting treatment. So it was a vicious cycle. And I ended up losing uh, a tremendous amount of energy, of course, lost a tremendous amount of weight, and uh, had a lot of time on my hands. So I turned to reading. And I read over 120 books on wellness and nutrition. I had a, a lot of time on my hands. And that's when I really kind of self-educated myself and realized that the drinks that my doctor had given me, and he had given me a conventional nutritional shake, um, and I won't mention names. Well, maybe I, I will, because it's not a big deal, but he gave me Ensure. And uh, you know, that I realized that you shouldn't be drinking that. And if you have any family members that you truly love and are drinking it, tell them to stop. So I realized during this time that these products that were being given to me and everyone in the hospital uh, were filled with inferior ingredients. They weren't actually nutritious. And that was incredible to me. I couldn't wrap my head around why these shakes were being given to everyone. So that really stuck with me. I, I went home and, and started blending my own organic shakes at home. My mom would help me and we'd blend five to six of these a day. And that's the only change I made in my diet. And I ended up gaining 15 to 20 pounds, felt much better and attributed a lot of my recovery to these magical organic shakes because I hadn't changed anything. So that stuck with me. I went on to, to medical school. I went on to uh, do my residency in family medicine and integrative medicine. And I was supposed to take over my dad's practice. Um, so as you can imagine, uh, the conversation didn't go well with my dad. So you know, after finishing medical school, completing my residency, I was, I was the chief resident. And, and then telling my dad only after three months of working with him at the clinic that I wanted to focus full time on Orgain. Uh, rightfully so, he didn't get it, right? And he didn't understand it. And he would ask me how, after seven years of schooling, after college, are you gonna leave this golden opportunity that I've built for you uh, and go sell these milkshakes? I don't get it, I don't understand it. Uh, and, you know, and it was something that, that he quickly understood with time. So some of the first lessons I learned even prior to starting Orgain were taught to me by cancer. So it taught me about nutrition. It taught me about organic food, uh, about supplementation. I take a variety of different supplements today that were from that self-education. Um, and it taught me that no matter what obstacles I faced later in life, um, they really couldn't be that bad. Uh, you know, they, they would likely pale in comparison to what I was going through. And lastly, and, and probably one of the most important things I would say is that it taught me about empathy. Uh, and I'll get into that maybe a little bit more, but lending a hand and being empathetic is a core value uh, and pillar of Orgain. So that's something that through an obstacle became a core pillar of the company that we built. So we could go to the next slide. Everything yields to diligence. I mean, what do you do when you don't know anything? Uh, you work as hard as possible. And I really, I had no business getting into this industry. Um, you know, I, I didn't know what I was doing, but I, I, I formulated the product with an amazing food scientist that I was very fortunate with. Uh, and we worked on over 50 formulations and they all tasted horrible. We finally arrived at one that tasted delicious and had all the key nutritional elements and ingredients that I felt were extremely important. But I didn't know what to do. And I asked him, I said, okay, this is great. So now what? And he said, I, you know, I, I don't know. I just formulate them. It's, you got to figure that part out. So I flew home. Uh, we had spent a few days in a lab working on it. And I flew home. And, uh, you know, for me, I had, I had just learned the language of medicine. And now was moving into a 
completely whole new world in food, which is a completely new language. I flew home and it, and it just so happened that there was going to be this natural food show that you're familiar with uh, that was three weeks away and 15 minutes from my house. Uh, I called and asked for some space and they said, yep, we have, we have a 10 by 10 available uh, in the basement. And that was, that was about 12, 13 years ago before it was cool um, to be in the basement. And I, and I went there and I showed up with, without anything. I showed up without a booth. I showed up without really a logo, nothing to hand out. I just had samples in blank packaging that our food scientist and I had, had created together. So uh, it was embarrassing. You walk in and you see these beautiful booths and you see people with staff and matching shirts and the whole nine. And, um, you know, it was just my wife and I, Kathy, and I looked at her and I said, I don't know if we should get out of here or if we should just <laughs> rough it out. But we paid a lot of money for this 10 by 10 booth. Let's just talk to people about the product and, and see what happens. Uh, so that's what I did. Started sampling the product. Everyone that went by, we sampled. Um, one person took an interest in it, asked me very smart questions about the product and asked me, can you come present it to us? Uh, and I said, absolutely, I'd be happy to present it to you thinking it was a physical therapist or, or something, a, a local clinic. His uh, name was- Back with the mic again, Andrew. Sorry. Oops, there you go. Okay, keep reminding. I got to remind myself here. Sorry. So uh, it wasn't a physical therapist. This guy, his name was Errol. He was the global buyer for Whole Foods. And uh, a few weeks later, I found myself on a plane going to Whole Foods to present it. Uh, the person presenting before me uh, was Heather Mills. So she had just divorced someone from the Beatles and inherited a lot of money and was presenting a, a frozen line of, uh, I think, vegan meals or something along those lines. But she had a very buttoned up presentation, a whole crew with her. And I walked in with uh, literally my two, <laughs> two organ packages and blank packaging uh, and uh, some flyers I had printed in color at Kinko's. So as I sat down with them, I, I was just honest. And I said, you know, the, the truth is I don't have anyone here with me. But what I do have is a product that I think is going to completely change a category. And I told them about the product. Uh, they liked the taste, but didn't give me much feedback one way or another. Uh, came home, a few weeks later, I got a phone call that said, can you handle a, a national launch? And of course, I had no idea what that meant. So I said, yes, absolutely, we'll do, we'll do it. And they asked me questions that I had no idea, like, uh, you know, go ahead and send us FOB pricing. No idea what that meant. I had no idea what that meant. And I said, yes, we'll, we'll, we'll get that right over to you. And, and then they were asking me questions uh, for the year. How many off shelves do you want to commit to? Any TPR? I had no idea. So I told them, I said, can I review with my team and, and get back to you? And, uh, you know, it sounded good. The problem was I didn't have a team. I, I you know, I, I hung up with them and, and had to just go back and figure this out and ask and, and, and see what I could do to make it work. And somehow, some way, things fell into place and I was able to produce the product and the product showed up on shelf and, and with zero marketing, zero know-how, zero experience really, the product started to sell and it started to sell really well. So there was a huge need for a product like this and, and we had created the world's first certified organic ready to drink shake. Um, one thing I learned through this is that an important lesson for me is that, is that if your product is differentiated enough, if it's truly needed enough and it, and it breaks through the clutter, everything else becomes significantly easier. If you spend a lot of time on innovation and less time just launching products for the sake of launching products, it's going to make things easier. Your marketing uh, becomes significantly easier. You're, you're serving a need. You know, this is something that people need to have. So you have to just be ready to, uh, you know, and you also have to be ready to adjust your approach. When, when I thought Orgain was going to be for cancer patients, for extra nourishment, someone that had digestive issues, maybe had a tooth, couldn't eat for a few days. But that turned out not to be the case. I found out in the first couple of weeks that it was, it was moms on the go, business professionals, students, athletes, active lifestyles. I didn't know that. And it wasn't part of my plan. But I quickly evolved Orgain to be a company that's focused on this nutritional lifestyle, getting clean protein, clean nutrition to the everyday person. And that's the company that we've become. But you have to be able to, to switch. Even though you have a plan in your mind, 
you have to kind of ride the wave that works. Um, as Gary mentioned, uh, I was the only employee at Orgain for the first five or six years. Uh, and I was working around the clock, literally nonstop. I mean, flying every week to a customer, to a supplier, a manufacturing plant. Um, I was spending the night at the plants. Uh, you know, I wasn't seeing my family at all. I was, I was all in. Uh, but beyond that, it's, you know, beyond that, it's understanding that I really didn't know anything, but I was committed to being super diligent in figuring it out. You know, you have to research and understand your market, uh, what you're doing and what you're trying to accomplish really more than anybody else. I've, I've found that, um, that diligence really helps tremendously. And I'll tell you that while I dedicated myself uh, to working harder than anyone, I, you know, I can't tell you that I worked in a very smart way. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a quote that I'm sure many of you know about Abraham Lincoln that says, give me six hours to chop down a tree and I'll spend the first four sharpening the ax, right? I spent about 10 minutes or so sharpening the ax, right? And, and the rest was making it happen with sheer will. And, and that part's frustrating, honestly, because you hit countless dead ends. Um, and sometimes you end up getting to where you need to be, but you realize that there was a short five mile straight road and I was taking the 200 mile uphill detour. Uh, don't do that to yourself, you know, be smart, uh, surround yourself with people that are smarter than you. Uh, in my case, that was uh, easier than most get advice, um, guidance, just ask, you know, when, when you're on the road, always ask if there's a, a shorter, smarter, better route. And quite frankly, you'll be surprised how many people are willing to, to help you out. So we could go to the next slide. You know, an entrepreneur, this slide, uh, you know, I like this slide a lot because it says an entrepreneur is someone who jumps off a cliff and builds a plane on the way down. It takes a huge leap of faith to do what we're doing. Uh, you learn on the go, the hard way, things are going to go wrong. And I used to think, how hard could it possibly be, right? You make a product, you somehow get it on shelf, uh, you get paid and you just accelerate that. You know, it, it's, and I was very simplistic. I thought it was just like when I used to sell lemonade as a kid, I, I charge a dollar and I get a dollar back, right? I didn't realize that you sell it for a dollar and you get 70 cents back. I, I, no one told me that. I didn't know it worked like that. Um, you know, no one told me that little tidbit on chargebacks, discounts, on sellables. All that fun stuff was a surprise to me, uh, but you have to adjust. So, and even on the product side, no one told me how difficult it would be to make an organic protein shake. Um, you know, I got a call a year in from Whole Foods saying that there's some customers having issues with the texture of the product. And I thought, what, what could possibly be wrong with the texture of the product? So I drove to Whole Foods, bought a shake, opened it, and turned it upside down, and nothing was pouring out. Uh, it had turned to pudding on shelf. Um, so, you know, typically, it, you know, when you, when you have a really complicated product like protein, you're dealing with stability and you do something called shelf studies where you examine how the product does over time. My shelf studies in the early years were happening on shelf. Um, so it, it, was, it was really important for me early on and thankfully I was able to work through it, but it was, you know, I can't tell you how many sleepless nights, you know, I panicked, I went back into the store and bought all of them and then realized that there's hundreds more that I have to figure out what to do. So it's one of these things where you have to maintain composure, be calm and figure out, okay, how do I get through this in, in, in a way that's not going to completely destroy me or the company? Um, another key lesson for me is, is, and Gary mentioned this, is just listening intently to your customer. Only up until three years ago, and I've had the business now for 12 years, only up until three years ago, and this may seem you know, a bit absurd, but I, I personally answered every single customer question. Literally replied via email under the name Mike uh, to every uh, consumer. And uh, Mike became a legend in our company. I was answering the phone and, and replying to customers and uh, they would say, what's your name? And I'd say, I'm Andrew. And they'd say, okay, great. And then they say, you're not Andrew the guy on the back of the package, are you? And I'd say, yes, I am. And, and you know, a lot of them thought that was great. And then some were a little bit weirded out, you know, like, okay, this guy is, what is he doing? Is he making these at home and selling them from, you know, his garage? So uh, I changed my name to Mike. 
and uh, Mike became just a stellar customer service representative and, uh, and really became a legend. We had people calling, uh, only asking for Mike, even those that would call and ask for a medical question and say, you know, I have a medical question. And I said, you know, I'm actually a physician. I'm happy to answer with that question for you. And they would say, you know what? Uh, you know, I appreciate that, but I actually feel much more comfortable speaking to Mike. And uh, people would come up to us at Expo West and ask to, to meet with Mike. And we would recommend that, you know, we would tell him that Mike isn't available, but to email us. And I'm sure he would reply. So uh, that I learned a lot. Being Mike uh, taught me a tremendous amount. I mean, till now, even though I don't reply to all of them, every single comment or question that comes in, and we get now well over 100 a day, uh, I listen intently. I've learned more from my customers than really, I think, any other research that I've done. You know, and, and people say, you're, you're so good with innovation. Uh, you, your company continues to launch innovation that works. And the truth is, I'm not that good at it. It's just that I listen extremely carefully to my customers. How did you know to launch a kid's shake, for example? Well, I would get a request and put it in a folder. And when I got to 2,000 requests, I figured it would be a good idea to launch a kid's shake. So listen to your customer. It's not rocket science. I mean, it, you really just listen to them and then you make a product that's going to exceed their expectations. And I think it boils down to just a few simple things. I mean, what do you need uh, to start and succeed in a business? I believe at least that you have to, you have to know your product better than anyone. Uh, you have to know your customer. And lastly, and we've touched on this, you have to have this burning desire to succeed. So we could go to the next slide. You know, and you don't, you can't do it alone. As much as I thought I could in the beginning, you know, this, uh, you have to, it's done by a team of people. This quote says, great things in business are, are never done by one person. They're done by a team of people. Um, of course, you stick to your instincts, but you get guidance from those that have made a ton of mistakes prior to you. Um, and know your limits. Uh, you know, I, I didn't recognize my limits. I mean, I knew my limits, but I thought I could just, work through them, you know, and I always ask myself if I surrounded myself with a team earlier, where would we be today? I mean, thankfully, uh, the company has thrived and done well, but really, I think it's important to know your limits and, and build a team. Um, and, and the team for us, everything that we do today is, and all the success we've had is a tribute to our team. Um, so it'll, it'll make you better, it'll make the company better. And then of course you press forward, uh, you know, with courage and have that same tenacity. We could go on to the next slide here. Uh, this is a, a slide focused on patience, right? You have to be patient. Uh, about three years into Orgain, I was telling my wife, Kathy, that, you know, I think people are really starting to um, recognize Orgain and know Orgain. And she'd say, really? I don't, are you sure? And I said, yeah, I really do. I really feel like people are, you know, it's getting out there. And we went to a grocery store and, and we're, you know, checking out and, uh, you know, the, the guy that was putting our groceries in the bag uh, looked up and he saw me wearing an Orgain shirt. And he said, hey, I just started using that. And I looked at Kathy and I said, see, I told you, you know, this, this is what I was talking to you about. And I was so happy. And then he was telling me, yeah, I use the foam on the back of my head and I've noticed an improvement already. And uh, that was defeating, right? It was defeating for me, but it, it, it kind of teaches you that uh, you have to be patient. These things take a long time. You have to play the long game, right? Um, it's easy, and it was easy for me, especially to want to rush, to get caught up in the day-to-day -day challenges of running a business. But you have to, I think, also carve out time, at least, I would say once a week maybe, to take stock of what you're doing for the long-term health of your business. You know, step back, I would step back and, and look at the products. Um, you know, what I was doing for marketing, the messaging, your engagement, cash flow. Uh, step back and look at the big picture. It's, it's, it's easy to get caught up, uh, you know, in, in kind of the day-to-day. -day. And really, I felt that the, the smart investments that you make today end up paying off huge in the future. Uh, but you always have to kind of keep perspective. And, and things are going to go wrong. Uh, people are going to mistake your product for uh, one that's much more well-known, and that's okay. Uh, you know, things, you, you just always have to find a way to pull yourself really out of that grind and think about the big picture 
uh, and make sure everything and everyone is aligning with your vision. So, so just be patient, I think is kind of the key takeaway here. Uh, my dad used to always tell me that the, you know, the, the day you plant the seed is not the day you eat the fruit. Uh, that's, it's important. It's, it's going to take some time. So I would uh, encourage everyone to really exercise that patience. Good things eventually come. Uh, you work tirelessly and you eventually actually, you get a few lucky bounces along the way. I know Gary mentioned how, how we met, but a quick side note on that is I went to that a nutrition show by myself in San Diego 10 years ago. It was hard to set up and do the booth by myself. Uh, and uh, it was just a pain, everything about it. And I felt like I didn't get anything out of it. But I met a nutritionist there that loved the product, asked if I could ship her samples. And, and she was based out of New Hampshire. Uh, and this was uh, Meg's nutritionist that Gary uh, talked about earlier, right? Uh, Gary reached out to me and uh, was our first and only uh, angel investor. And as he said, yeah, you know, it's on our board and sits on our board today. So, and we've, you know, we've truly become great friends. If it wasn't for that random show that I went to, that I initially thought was a waste of time. And, you know, I, I packed my car and it was just, you know, the whole booth, everything starts to finish. Uh, you know, I wouldn't have Gary as a mentor or a board member. So remember that sometimes the hard work um, puts you uh, sometimes where the good luck, can, good luck can find you. So, uh, and that's been true for me. Sometimes just that, that hard work will put you in a position of good fortune or good luck. We could go to the next slides. So. Andrew, let's do a couple more minutes. Okay. We'll breeze through these quickly here. Um, so this just shows kind of where we've been able to grow, or these are the, now the NCAA teams that are purchasing Orgain. Uh, you know, so we could just skip through those, the professional teams that are purchasing Orgain, and now the medical centers that are uh, carrying Orgain. And this is something I would have never imagined because we were kind of the story of David and Goliath, right? We were up against huge companies, uh, huge pharmaceutical companies, and we're able to get it done. So on the next one, as, as you scale and as you get more, you know, and, the, and your business thrives, you know, people look at me and say, wow, he's, he's really got it together. He's super brave. And it, it reminds me, and I've seen this, where there's a guy riding a lion, right? And you say, wow, he's super brave. Look at him, right? The truth of the matter is, and on the next slide, the reality is, is I ask myself, how the hell did I get on a lion and how do I keep from getting eaten, right? And that's the truth. And if someone tells you otherwise, um, you know, that's, it's typically not true. So um, you have to be able to maintain an even keel and, and the lion doesn't eat you when you have that humility, that respect, uh, you have the team surrounding you that's going to help push you forward. Um, we could go on to the next one. I think it's important to, you know, as, as we're seeing now, I know Gary touched on this, uh, adjusting to the times. We're seeing what's happening with COVID and you have to be diversified, not only in your channels uh, and eventually with your products, but you have to be able to pivot and pivot very quickly. Uh, recognize opportunities. Um, you know, I felt that Amazon would be a huge part of our business. So I set up the listing myself uh, about 10 years ago and managed every single aspect of it. And I'm still very involved in the Amazon portion of our business, uh, not only because I love it and enjoy it, but I feel it's, it's part of the future. And with COVID and what's happening with the global pandemic now, I personally believe we've moved up kind of the inevitable shift to e-commerce by many years, right? I mean, my own mom has been ordering things on Instacart, right? You know, we just got her, we just taught her how to buy things on Amazon and she's ordering things on, on Instacart now. So uh, the landscape that was going to change uh, is now changing and it's rapidly accelerated. So you have to work quickly. I mean, while I was on a phone, with a retailer that was telling me the store traffic was down, I was typing an email to our D2C team um, and our head of sales on Amazon to see what we could do to pivot and pivot quickly. So uh, it's important that while others are thinking about doing something, you do it, uh, you know, move with purpose and move quicker than others. So we'll move on to the next slide. And I think I'll just touch on this. I mean, when you're in a position to give back, uh, you give back uh, and it pays dividends, right? I mean, I think for us, we, we, give away, we gave away this last couple of weeks, or a few weeks, protein shakes to healthcare workers on the front lines. And it's, it's amazing the feedback that we've been getting, the pictures, the letters, the stories. It's just incredible that we're able to nourish those on the front lines. On the next slide. 
Grants for Greater Good, we're giving away uh, $50,000 to three companies. So a total of $150,000 to companies that are doing something for the greater good. So in the field of nutrition, active lifestyle or mindfulness, um, you know, we feel it's extremely important. So for me, it's important to always find a way to give back, whether it's your time, your products, your knowledge, your ability to give back in a way that's meaningful is the best thing I think you can do for yourself. And uh, notice I didn't say others, it's, that's a given. I, I think it's truly the best thing you can do for yourself. So you learn a tremendous amount about yourself and it's a constant reminder of what truly matters. And I'll end it with just maybe bringing it full circle. Um, for me, Orgain is, is much more than a protein or nutrition company. We have thousands of people living on Orgain as their sole source of nutrition. Uh, my father passed away a few years ago and, and his last 18 months of life, he lived on Orgain. So it's, it's much more than a protein company and I would encourage everyone here to make your company much more than what you're selling, right? Make it much bigger uh, in its mission and its purpose and, and if you do that, I feel like you'll have a company that has longevity and hopefully a team that doesn't just like working for you, but, but really believes in you. And um, this is just a link to Grants for Greater Good and, uh, and my email address uh, in case I could help with anything along your journey. So with that, I'll stop talking and we'll open it up to questions. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. And thanks for speeding up a little bit. I appreciate that. There's, there's, a, uh, there's a ton to get to here. Um, I think... I was hoping we could start just by going back to that, that first launch at Whole Foods. You, you talked about learning who your customer was and that it was someone completely different than who you thought. I just think we can start there and then I, I want to get into kind of how you guys have changed your, your innovation and, and, and product strategy and how you learn now. But at that time, how did you learn and how did you learn in a meaningful enough way to really shift who you were talking to? Muted. Muted myself on that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so I was saying, I was personally surprised to see the letters that were coming in uh, were from a demographic that I never anticipated. Um, so like I mentioned, I thought we were going to be in hospitals and helping cancer patients, and that was going to be our primary line of business. But when I saw like, you know, students from UC Irvine and UCLA and, and moms, I thought, wow, this is a lot bigger. And, uh, you know, we had to adjust. And today our innovation is based on that learning from the beginning. Uh, so we focus on plant-based protein powders, uh, plant-based shakes, um, really on-the-go convenient nutrition for everyone. So we, now what we're doing is we're appealing to the masses, we're making uh, organic available to the masses, and we're doing it in a way that resonates and people can use it in their everyday life. And so even, even at your size now, are, is Orgain still learning on shelf? Or have you, I mean, obviously you create longer product timelines and do actual shelf life studies and things like that. But yeah. are you, uh, how much of that, uh, who your consumer is for this product, are you learning prior to launch versus when you guys are just out? Yeah, I mean, I think we're learning a lot more and doing it in a bit more disciplined way today. I mean, I was relying solely on, on what the customers were telling us before. But I think, you know, it's a combination of things. I think it's your gut instinct. You, you know what your customers want and what they're looking for and what you think is going to succeed. But now you want to validate that. You validate it with your existing customers. We validate it with customers that are not buying Orgain today, but are within our category. Uh, so I think today it just, it's a much more robust way to validate your gut instincts. Before it was just, you know, I think this is going to work and you push it out. But today it's, it's a lot more disciplined. Yeah. And I think it's just hearing this, obviously I'm early stage and there are a lot of people on here that are earlier stage. And I think it sounds, uh, there's sort of like two contrasting ideas here around sharpening your ax, but also learn, you know, learning live and learning in real time. And I, I think, um, I would be curious what you would have to say to people here who are, who are early and, uh, feeling the pressure of, you know, in, in theory, you have an innovative product that, and when you have a good idea, somebody else is probably thinking about it too. So they're feeling that kind of timeline pressure to just launch and get out there versus having it right before you ever touch a shelf. Yeah, and I, and I would encourage everyone to take the leap of faith that I was talking about earlier. I know sometimes it's not buttoned up and sometimes you wanna do the research but you don't have the resources or the time. It's really trusting yourself. 
Uh, does the, is this product going to resonate with the customer? At a certain point, no matter what you do, you have to jump off the cliff, right? And for, for early on, you know, early startups and, and companies that are just getting going, um, you know, that jump uh, is, requires a lot more faith. And I think, I think if you have that gut instinct and you feel good about it and you've done the research and the basic homework, um, I would encourage you to kind of take that leap of faith and do the, the stuff comes later, right? If I had done enough diligence early on, uh, we wouldn't have been successful, right? So, At a certain so, point. Let me pop in here on piggyback on Ethan's question, Andrew, and push you a tad. So a lot of folks on this call, and uh, we've been talking about this all month, are in a particularly um, challenging cash moment, right? Yeah. Uh, a lot of their uh, channels have dried up or have delayed or there's just a lot of things out of their control. And we've been, we've been pre preaching the gospel of watch your cash, watch your cash, watch your cash. Sure. Uh, innovating is very cash consumptive, right? Launching a new. So could you comment and, and could you two part question, I guess, could you comment on your uh, philosophy about SKUs? How many are too many? How do you make a decision uh, when to pull that trigger, that leap off the cliff? Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and in this time right now with uh, a little bit more nervousness, we don't know what kind of recessionary trends are ahead of us. Uh, what, what would be your particular counsel? It, you know, in other words, sharpen that leap, that leap off the cliff. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so maybe Gary, starting with the number of SKUs, I, I would encourage everyone to focus on just a few, a handful, right? I mean, I, in the beginning, I even in the first couple of years, I hired a consultant that told me, you know, you just have chocolate and vanilla. I think you should have strawberry and mango and, and went through and he says, because I think you need that six, seven item on shelf. And common sense told me that, well, shouldn't we see if chocolate and vanilla works first, right? And those are the, 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 the best selling in the category and by, by, a lot, by a big margin, right? So I would say when it comes to SKU count, be focused in the beginning. Our number of SKUs expanded just in the last five years, right? We were ultra, ultra diligent in just driving the SKUs that work, right? And when it comes to cash flow, I think today more than ever, you have to be extremely mindful of your cash. Innovation is, is one part where uh, you don't wanna let your foot off the gas, but you wanna be mindful of your resources. So I would say that you wanna take the money that you have or what's coming in that's available to you and, and put it back into the company in a smart way. You know, now the, the landscape has changed. Uh, the marketing that you did three months ago is going to be a lot different than the marketing that you do today. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we adjusted our, our D2C business. We doubled down on Amazon. We've had, uh, you know, the best month we've ever had, right? And I think it's because that you have to adjust your cash flow. Whether you're a big company or a smaller company, you have to focus on the things that are working. Really make sure that if, if there's 10 options, focus on the top two that you know are going to deliver the results and bet big on those. Thanks. So I, I had a couple more just about innovation, just because I, th I think it is something that you guys have done an extraordinary job of, both in, in the early stage in maybe not doing as much innovation and then also what you've done recently with our game kids and, and some of the products behind you. I, I think uh, for the, you know, most people on here are founders. So you started off very similar to most founders with a, a product that was personal to you and that was solving a problem for you. And I think as you, as you guys have expanded products and maybe you're not quite as close to it, um, how, how, do you, how do you make sure you're maintaining that connection to the consumer for you personally? Uh, or is it something that you, know, you, really, you start to rely on your team more for as you guys expand beyond more products than anyone could reasonably consume. Yeah, no, well, I think first the innovation, whoever is, is running innovation or the, the person that's running the company has to be extremely close to innovation, uh, no matter how big you get. Um, you know, it's the innovation at Oregon up until maybe just three months ago was a team of one, right? It was just, just myself. And I, I think it's extremely important to maintain that discipline. But founders really, I think, in, in addition to being very close to very close to the customer. I think as long as you establish tight guardrails in the beginning of what's most important to you, 
you know, innovation can take a variety of different forms, but you don't deviate from the things that are non-negotiables, right? Yeah. Uh, we've had, uh, you know, our first investment into the company uh, it's just recently. And, and for me, one of the discussions I used to always have with them is that no matter what we do, these are the strict guardrails. And I would, and anyone starting off, as long as you maintain those strict guardrails and say, our products have to deliver this, these three things we don't deviate from, I think the rest kind of falls into place and you don't have to overthink it, right? Yeah, right. You create the, the framework that everything else can, can abide by. Exactly, exactly. So we have a, a ton of questions rolling okay. in. Um, I think I'll try to kind of group some together here. Um, one yeah. thing that clearly the audience has glommed onto for, for a reason is just uh, how you did that on your own at the beginning to, yeah. to put it bluntly, just because um, most everyone else we've had on here ha hasn't, I mean, most everyone in this space hasn't been able to do that on their own. And so there's a few questions here just about the, the early days. I think um, how did you simplify your operations so you could run it on your own is one. Um, as a one man shop, you must've had a lot of contractor relationships. How did you find working with contractors and manage all those relationships on your own? So these are sort of nitty gritty yeah. early and find questions Love and, me. and how did you find capital? Yeah. yeah, no. So all, all great questions. I, I think in the beginning, I would just try to find the, the easiest way possible to make it work. Right. And, and to be frank, I didn't have redundancy in supply chain. So in the beginning, when I ordered cocoa, it was one supplier. If anything happened to that supplier, it was over. There was no, we'd have to reformulate. I, there was, so I would say that in the beginning I did things and it was, it was really kind of hanging by a thread. I was very fortunate that it worked out. It's not something that I recommend, but really what I would try to find is the easiest way to make it work. And, and when that was production, what was the lowest amount of production I could produce? Uh, what's the lowest minimum quantities uh, for cash? I would pay, quite frankly, I'd have to pay late you know, and just get on the phone with the suppliers and explain to them why payments were going to be coming in late. So it, it's kind of a dance and it's a dance that was extremely difficult for sure in a variety of different ways. But to the question about contractors, I think it's, it's absolutely critical that you hire contractors that are going to help you. So if it's not someone on staff, it's someone that can guide you. Now, what I wish I did is I wish that I hired someone that was a consultant on operations maybe earlier. Because I took that upon myself, you know, and I was getting the quotes for every truck myself and figuring out rail versus over the road and all that kind, you know, those kinds of things. If you find someone that knows that part of the, of the business, they pay for themselves very quickly. Mm. Uh, they pay for themselves very, very quickly and it saves you a lot of time. So I would say simplify your operations by finding the key areas that you don't want to spend too much time in. Focus on the things that matter and bring in consultants that can help you. Uh, so that things don't fall apart. And how would you compare that to the sales side? Obviously, there's in in operations, sales, any department, there's a lot you have to learn on yourself. But sales is is much more personal, and uh, most early stage entrepreneurs are doing all their own sales. So, can you just talk about that evolution from what you did then, when you decided it was time to bring in more of a sales organization? Sure. And, and sales, I think, is, is extremely important to do, and the founder should be in, as involved as possible from the beginning all the way through. So till today, I mean, I'm at every Costco, Walmart, Amazon. Those are all, those are meetings that I am there for, right? Mm -hmm. That nothing has changed. But what was extremely difficult for me was, was all the paperwork in the beginning, right? And, and figuring out the new item paperwork and what to do. So getting a broker to help you on the paperwork, making sure you're on schedule, reset schedules for all of these, just keeping you organized and opening the door for you, I found that there's no better salesperson than the person that started it, right? But you need the support. You need someone to open the door for you to tell you, don't do this, don't say this, this is what this retailer is all about. <laughs> but in terms of, in terms of sales, uh, there's no more compelling person to tell someone to purchase this product and why you should uh, than, than the actual uh, person behind it. Yeah, and that's definitely been my experience as well. It was just funny hearing you talking about OIs and MCBs. Yeah. I think we've all had that moment when you first start selling that you're like, yeah, sure, that, that sounds good. Um, but, but having somebody in those early days that actually knows what, what those mean and can, can walk you through what's a good deal and what's not, I think is, is pretty crucial. Um, I, wanted to, uh, I wanted to ask 
about um, some of these sort of supplemental aspects to your business in particular. Um, we talked with Shazi last week about third party validators mm -hmm. and where those have fit in for her. Um, bringing in some of the science uh, behind what you're doing and how you translate that to the customer. Uh, in other words, educate. Um, and then also if you could just touch on, I mean, you, you talked about grants and what you guys are doing for healthcare workers, just how that actually comes back around to benefit the business yeah. um, and what your perspective yeah. on, on that is. Yeah. So maybe I'll start there. I mean, I think, you know, I've found, you know, it, it, since day one, anyone that can afford the product, uh, and is dealing with cancer, we ship them product free of charge. That's something that we've done since day one. That's never changed. We do that. It's a no questions asked policy. Um, and and you'll be, you'd be really surprised uh, what, you know, all we ask in return is for them to update us on their health and how they're doing and to help us spread the word. Mm. Um, when you genuinely give back and you, and you give back really not looking for much in return, that's when great things happen right? The, the Shakespeare Heroes program that we did, it's, it's really the first thing I thought of was, gosh, I remember working at the hospital 30 hours under normal circumstances, and it sucked. It was horrible. I can't imagine, you know, the doctors, what they're going through now and dealing with all of this. So, and they're probably not eating. And we did yeah. that out of a genuine care. And, and that genuine care uh, actually resulted in just tremendous feedback. There was, you know, outlets that picked it up. There was, I mean, we got so many even new customers through it. So if you genuinely give back, it pays dividends, I think. Yeah. And sorry, Ethan, what was the, the other question? Um, oh, I was asking, how, yeah, if you guys have used just, I guess that sort of touched on it because I think you've, you with a medical background obviously sort of gives it a, a legitimacy, but just for those who, who really believe that they've created a better product than whatever else is out there, how do you talk about that and educate people about that you actually are doing something better? Yeah. So I think the key is you have to make it as, as easy and digestible as possible for the consumer to understand it. I mean, we have competitors in our space that use complicated ingredients. Uh, you know, they have scientific studies and so forth. What we go back to is that we just focus on food, you know, and food has a tremendous ability to heal and take care of you if you get clean sources of food. Mm. And that's what we're saying. We're saying, hey, this nutritional shake... That you're, that you're making is that you're drinking is made in a lab has these synthetic ingredients and these artificial flavors sweeteners all of this stuff and we just keep it basic you know and and when you keep it basic and you eat clean whole foods the body just does extremely well so i would the i think the key takeaway here is keep it simple keep it simple keep your message clear so that a buyer understands it your customers get it everyone you talk to instantly knows what you're about has, has that approach, that messaging contrasted at all with some of the more kind of biohacky um, <laughs> angles on, on the category for you guys? No, I mean, I think it fits. I mean, it, it's, you could, you know, we have people that biohack that use our products. We have people that live on our products, even though they don't necessarily need to. Mm. Uh, but I think you adjust. So we're, we make keto products, but we make them our own. So it's, you know, obviously there's a lot of science and studies behind the ketogenic diet, but we're saying, look, instead of using these ingredients, we spray, dry, we spray dry organic avocado oil, coconut oil, cocoa butter, all certified organic. Yeah. So we feel like you could fit into those science backed diets, but do it in a clean way. And in an authentic way. You know, I, I just want to say, uh, for those watching, uh, you know, look over Andrew's left shoulder. Uh, because there they are, I don't know, four or five feet away, and those products are screaming uh, what they are. Now, of course, if you're Ethan's, you know, you don't have that quite that size of pack. So I, I, you know, scale helps. But what I mean is at a glance, you know it. And it with so many companies that I'm talking to right now, and one's, in fact, in the process of renaming right now. In fact, Ethan, you just went through it, uh, re, uh, repos uh, repositioning. Uh, I just think now is the time in such a crowded space with consumers being um, really neat, really, you know, being confused, but also looking for certain things. You got it. Say it. Just don't yeah. don't be oblique about it. All the poetry, you know, fine. Do it another time when you're, you know, wealthy and successful right now. If it's organic protein say it. If it's wellness, say it. If it helps you sleep, say it. If it gets you drunk, say it, you know, just say it. 
Yeah, I mean that. Just yeah, to echo I, that, that, I, that. I think that's that couldn't it couldn't be more true. Yeah, and that's been our learning too, is just to hit hit people over the head with it, basically. Um, all right, uh, Rosa just asked, um, what should new brands do to gain distribution during this time? Is it possible, or will retailers only start carrying and testing new brands once the coronavirus is over? I don't know if you're ready to answer that one, but that's been a really common question. Sure, and it's a great question and timely now. I mean, buyers are being, uh, you know, very picky. They're pushing reset schedules back and so forth. But you know, you have one tool that can get any item you want, and uh, you know, unless it's in a freezer or perishable, uh, and that's your laptop. You know, you could put a listing up. You could sell your product online through your website, through Amazon uh, by tomorrow, right? So you could do it very quickly. So I think while buyers may be uh, pushing back their schedules, try to find ways to get your product in front of people. And I think, I think buyers are going to be a little bit more receptive uh, to, to new products and getting products in. But I would encourage you that if you, if you have a path to direct to consumer or the e-commerce channel, uh, now is a perfect time. Great. Um, I like this question from, from Peter. Uh, he said, this is about sort of about your shift. I, I, most people here are creating the alternative to something, but now you guys are, are kind of the elephant in the room. Um, Peter asked, you created the organic protein segment, AKA clean protein. Now you have other organic protein competitors. Vega comes to mind. They make what you make at least by statement of identity. How do you prepare for that and differentiate going forward? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And, uh, you know, it's, it's something that it's top of mind for me all of the time, right? We entered into the plant-based powder space about six, seven years ago at a time where I shouldn't have entered into the plant-based powder space. It was extremely crowded, mm. large companies, like he mentioned, Vega, Garden of Life, others. Uh, how did we succeed? How are we the number one selling plant protein powder in the U.S. today? Uh, it's it's really a focus on, can we make it taste better? Can the texture be better? Can the nutritional profile be better? All of the key components, ingredients, nutritional profile, taste, texture, can we beat them on everything? And, and if you take that to heart uh, with your products, uh, you know, it, it, you don't focus on the big competitors. I, I never really look to my right or left. Of course, we try every competitive product, but I just look forward. You know, and, and I, and I want to make sure that what we're doing is going to resonate and resonate in a big way and be disruptive. So, um, you know, there's a lot of people that said, I, I'm discouraged. They tell me I'm discouraged by these large companies. I mean, we, I, I launched Orgain uh, to be against Abbott Pharmaceutical, $60 billion company, right? And um, it, again, it, it doesn't matter. Focus on how you're going to differentiate yourself and the rest kind of falls into place. Yeah, and we've heard a couple common themes. I'm, I'm seeing with some of these questions, there's people who have logged into every single webinar. And I, I think staying close to your products has been one that we haven't highlighted as loudly, Dad, but it's been a really consistent one, uh, especially with Nicole, Tom first. They talked about just being, you know, when you start to get distracted by other things, always coming back to mm -hmm. focusing so obsessively and intently on every aspect of your product. And then the marketing and packaging and positioning all kind of falls into place after yeah, that. Yeah, uh, such a good point and it's so well said, Ethan. You know, last two nights ago, uh, I, on video, Andrew and Ethan, um, I shot a, uh, a yogurt cheese making uh, demo, just taking a quart of yogurt. I mean, what could be easier, right? Pour it into <laughs> cheesecloth. And, um, and I happened to use our strawberry whole milk yogurt. And then my neighbors down the road, the kids are driving their mom insane. I brought them the cheese because I didn't want to eat all this cheese. And they just devoured it. And I'm so sorry I didn't film that. You know, they're eating. <laughs> but the point is that that's a product that we've had for 34 years. Uh, it's a core product. Uh, and in these times with people home uh, being e e economizing, you know, it's come back down to, um, you know, that, that core thing, that core proposition. So I, I, I think that's really well said. Um, sorry, I'm just making sure we get to all these questions. Uh, they're still kind of rolling in steadily. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, I like this one because it's sort of pressing you on, uh, on a common one. I, I think the answer for a lot of brands that are just starting out on these so far has been like, well, just start online and launch online. So yeah. I'm going to 
push you a little bit on it because Elizabeth asked, if a brand were to launch online tomorrow, what should they do first? Brand owned website, Amazon, other online marketplaces. And I'll just add, you know. Good question. Wow. It's a great question. It's a great question. Um, so I would say that getting set up on Amazon, it's, it's not instant, right? But, you know, I was just playing around the other day, uh, you know, for, I have two boys, 10 and nine, and he was asking me about websites and so forth. And I said, well, let me, let's go online and I'll show you how easy it is to make a website now. And, you know, my son is 10 years old uh, and we made a website together very quickly. So I would say that do them. And this is, this is something that if you ask anyone on my team, I'll tell them the same thing. And it's probably not the best answer, but that they like to hear, but do everything in parallel, do both, right? Get, get learn about Amazon listing, get that set up. It's going to take time for them to receive product, uh, to get it up and going. But in the meantime, while that's happening, while you're setting up Amazon and waiting for, you know, the, what you need to wait for, your website can get up and running and you could learn a lot through Shopify. I mean, it's, it's just, it's, it's that easy. You know, I don't want to overcomplicate it. Yeah. Yeah. And there's kind of, I mean, there's also a theme here emerging just about self-educating and just, you know, instead of speculating too much, just getting online and figuring it out. People are going to want to know if your 10 year old is available for consulting. He is. No, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm grooming him to kind of take over for me in the next couple of weeks here since we have so much time. <laughs> um, so there's a couple questions. Um, we're, we're sort of all over the place, but we're covering a lot. Um, there's a couple questions about um, the kids line because uh, you mentioned that. So the, the first one uh, was, have you found that your kids line has taken up the lion's share of revenue? I, I'm going to go ahead and say no, but um, similar to honest kids, honest tees, kids skews, or does the original RTD milkshake continue to make up the majority of your revenue? And then there was another question just asking about, um, what you guys have done for distribution on kids. I think people are interested in that line because it, it was, it wasn't just, um, you know, just another skew added. Uh, yeah, that, was, that question came from Vega, by the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, good. Uh, good. So, you know, I, I think, I think for us, uh, kids is, uh, is a line that just, it made sense for us. We've had a lot of people that come in and, and, you know, think, you know, you have a core item and just add a kid's item and it'll do well. And they largely fail. Right. I think for us, we were very well differentiated. Our kids line was something that was in between, say, a chocolate milk that had 34 grams of sugar and a Pediasure, which, you know, I, I can't believe kids consume today. Right. So we found ourselves right there in the middle and we hit a sweet spot. So we were appealing to kids on the go after soccer practice, picky eaters, those that need, needed extra nutrition. So I think the product has to work. And then in terms of distribution, we started online. Kids started online and, oh, and we gained, yeah, and, and we learned a lot about kind of what we could adjust in the product. Uh, we reduced the sugar recently by 30%. We're continuing to push the innovation on that. So we started online and then we were at Whole Foods and went in the natural channel, got into grocery at Costco now nationally with that item. Mm. Um, so it, it really kind of evolved and you have to do it in a kind of a stair step approach uh, yep. to be safe. But I would say kids items, they're, they're not easy. You have to, you know, unless you're hyper focused on them and then that's what you're doing. If it's a part of your line, you have to make sure that you're giving it the time that it needs because it does take some heavy lifting to do. Yeah, it you can't just, you can't just throw it in there with the word kids on it. No, not anymore. Um, so we got to wrap up. So the last question um, from Trevor was what further aspirational goals do you have for the company? Great, great question. That's, that, is, that is a great question. I mean, I, I founded the company uh, with the hope of really uh, having people lead healthy, more healthy, vibrant lives. That was my goal in the beginning. What can I do to, for people to realize it? I think what's happening today is that Orgain is very much a platform today for clean nutrition. And I feel like we could go in a variety of different directions. And, yeah. and I'm tempted to go in six or seven of them, but you, know, you have to have that discipline and you have to have uh, you know, you have to make sure that you're asking yourself, is this the right path for the company? Aspirationally, I want Orgain to be synonymous with clean nutrition. I mean, just like when someone thinks of uh, Kleenex for tissues, or, you know, I, I want uh, Orgain to be synonymous with clean nutrition and clean protein. That's, that's, that's the hope. That's the goal. And we want to try to uh, improve the well-being of people as much as possible. Yeah. And I think creating that that platform to build off of it's a really long view but it sort of is the ultimate goal really for any product even starting off with just a couple SKUs is is to is to create something like that that you can you know, launch anything that to your earlier point is within the bounds of your mission so 
Cool. That that's all I got. Thank you, Ethan. So, yeah. Andrew, no hair growth f f uh, tonic ahead of you. So, it's a uh, no, no hair growth. Even though I will tell you, this this haircut was now two weeks ago because my wife uh, forgot to put the clip on. So I'm just recovering <laughs> from looking like Gandhi here. But uh, you know, no no hair tonic in the future. So, Andrew, uh, Ethan, thank you so much. Uh, Andrew, as a rule, I like to try to summarize the key takeaways, and you've made it harder than ever. Uh, there are so damn many, but let me give a crack. And if I have anything wrong or missing here, let's uh, wrap with this. Um, the things that went wrong uh, could take all day to talk about. You know, people, people see you as this big success, but that was your admission from the beginning. I love the dream is free, but the hustle sold separately. Um, you know, easy to dream, it's all grit, right? Um, cancer taught me that um, uh, whatever other obstacles I would face would pale by comparison. I think that's, you know, a very obviously a positive way to deal with illness, but also I think it's an important insight that, uh, you know, you got to be ready to take it all. It, um, everything yields to diligence. What more can I say? Um, I love, ha I had the right product, little else. And people should really hear that. I mean, that. Ethan's right, this has been a constant theme. But the right product doesn't mean too many products, right? The right product means the right product. And you only you know what that is, Andrew obviously did. Um, even though you had a plan uh, in motion, uh, you need to ride uh, whatever wave goes your way. Uh, you know, be flexible, be ready. Surround yourself with people smarter than you. I love that one. Uh, um, and uh, certainly I've benefited from that. Just keep asking and you'll be surprised how many people will offer to help. This is the don't ask, uh, you know, uh, uh, if you don't ask, you don't get uh, adage that I, I use. Uh, maintain composure, be calm in the face of chaos. Uh, you know, business every day. People who say, gosh, I had a lot of problems today. That is business, right? So being calm and keeping it chill. Um, know your customer better than anyone, right? That's really important. Know who you're sitting across the desk from. Do your homework, do that extra bit of work. Know what worked, what didn't work. Know them really, really well. Uh, have a burning desire to succeed. That's a, can't be said enough. Uh, know your limits. Uh, great things in business are really performed by a team, achieved by a team. And uh, of course you were a team of one at the, at the beginning, but I know in fact that isn't true because I always say that, but I, 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 I know Kathy was critical. Without her, you wouldn't be here, but you know, Know, know that you need your team. Um, carve out time at least once a week to look at the big picture. It's easy to get caught up in the day to day. And that's really easy to say and easy uh, to preach and hard as hell to do. But boy, I think that's really a profound wisdom. So I'm glad you said it. I love your dad's line. Uh, the day that you plant the seed is not the day that you harvest the fruit. It takes patience. And uh, you know, if you think you're gonna do this overnight, then uh, you're not. <laughs> you're just not. Hard work puts you in a good position to make luck happen. That's such a great line. You know, luck, luck doesn't just happen. It, you make it happen. Um, give back. Make your company much more than what it is selling. Uh, especially in these times, I think people are really looking for authenticity. You've said the word compassion a number of times. Um, on a very tactical level, uh, fewer skews is better. And Ethan knew I wasn't going to let the day go by without saying that again. <laughs> Uh, the CEO must remain extremely close to innovation. I think that's really valid. Uh, keep it simple. Keep your message clear. I think we hammered that one. And uh, I loved, I loved, loved, loved that, you know, yeah, you got competitors to your left and right, but look forward, look ahead. Can you make it better and focus on your thing, less on them? And uh, obviously you stepped into a world with incredibly, profoundly well-financed folks. Uh, did I miss anything uh, major here? That, that's a uh, yeah, that's no, great. I think you did a great job. Yeah. All right, all right. Well, I'm listen. I'm writing a book with all this. Stuff. <laughs> um, uh, Carlene, if you could po post the slide of the uh, next seminars uh, for a minute, uh, we'll just wrap up here shortly. I just say to folks, uh, remind you, uh, like I said, Thursday we have Drake Sadler. Uh, next Tuesday we're bringing her back. Uh, uh, Myra Goodman has been out of the natural foods world for a little bit, but she is a profoundly, she and her husband Drew are profoundly successful entrepreneurs, creators of Earthbound Farms and 
I had to sort of pull Mara's teeth. So you better show up and show her a crowd. But she's she's great. Her story is awesome. Her her TED X talk on there is no such thing as big organic is one of the classics of all time. Wednesday, like we mentioned, Kehi in for NCG. You saw them on Andrew's list earlier. Critical partners right now. Uh, a lot of the a lot of these folks you can go direct to them. So stay tuned. Uh, and then uh, a very special treat, Sonal Shah, uh, who's uh, my friend, uh, former policy director for uh, Mayor Pete, but also she uh, ran uh, uh, President Obama's White House Office of Social Innovation Civic Participation. She and her siblings have done some fascinating bottom of the pyramid entrepreneurship in India, uh, which I think you'll really enjoy on Thursday the 30th, so spread the word. Uh, I remind you all, uh, we'll take a brief pause the following week um, as we uh, go into our institute that Thursday and Friday, please sign up. I think you'll be blown away by the cases. Uh, that's on the um, 7th and 8th, uh, $50. Uh, you, you really almost can't afford not to do this. Uh, you can come and you can go uh, uh, all day long, uh, both days, but I promise you, there's just going to be an encyclopedia of jewels there. You'll notice uh, first panelists in the financing case is a name you might know here. Um, this Friday is all pitches. If you're looking to raise money, whoops, we've got to change that slide. It's not 16, it's 14, and it's over 40 active investors, so we'll fix that. Um, and as I said, we will resume right after the Institute. We will resume in May. We have some excellent speakers lined up. Uh, Wayne Wu from um, uh, VMG will be on. Andy Whitman uh, will be on. We have a, quite a few investors talking about what they're looking for in this changing and dynamic market. Uh, just added uh, moments ago, Danny Meyer of Shake Shack fame and uh, uh, Union Square Food Group. Uh, it will be on. Danny had to uh, let 2,000 people go in this COVID crisis, so he certainly has some uh, stories to share with us. And many, many more. We've got just some really wonderful uh, treats that will keep this going all month. So uh, with that, uh, Andrew, a thousand thanks. You are awesome, as I knew you would be. Ethan, you know, you're amazing, just like a son to me. <laughs> and uh, everybody else, uh, thank you, Julie, Carleen, and, and we will see you all, I hope, on Thursday. Thanks, and stay safe. Awesome. Thanks, thank guys. You. Thank you. Bye-bye.